All right, I'm here with Steve Bechtel. Steve, can you introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, Jared, thanks for having me. I really appreciate talking to you. I, I always value our conversations. Um, yeah, my name is Steve Bechtel. I'm a climbing coach and a gym owner, and um, I work with a climbing coaching company, ClimbStrong, um, where I work alongside 10 other climbing coaches uh, trying to help people improve at the sport. I also take time to uh, learn a lot, try to, try to read a lot, and then to try to write a lot and assimilate training information into, um, well, really to try to take complex ideas and make them into simple uh, plans that people can then, then use to help that move their climbing forward. And so that's the main focus of my work these days. And you have a ton of resources that, you know, books and online content um, that climbers yeah, can use. I'm, I was, I was really, I was really uh, psyched the other day. Uh, I was talking to somebody where we're assembling a book on uh, a book of articles that I, that I've written over the years. And there were something like 180 articles that, um, that we were trying to, to filter down to like 12 of them or something. And so I was like, Oh, wow, we, we really do have a lot of content. And um, so there's a ton of, a ton of content on climbstrong.com. And um, then, you know, I do a newsletter and I, like I said, I've written a couple of books on, on, training for climbing. And so really um, try to keep refining and, and honing that, that idea. And as you know, and probably the reason you're writing the second edition is because you've learned more and, and you want to um, be able to share that. And if we can learn more and be able to teach it better, it's, it's kind of our job to, you know, come out with a second edition or do, do another article. And, um, and it's a, it's a fun job to have. Yeah, it's always fascinating to look back on stuff that was written, you know, that either of us wrote like five years ago and say, ooh, it'd be nice to do a little bit of editing here or some some revisions. So well, is isn't it fascinating? I've I've actually been in a situation where where someone was angry and they said, How why did you change your mind on this? And and I don't think it I don't think it's wrong to change your mind. And and actually changing your mind is what we call learning. Um and when, when we do change our minds, it's because we, we continue to advance. And although it's easy to say, oh yeah, you know, Jared is, is the, you know, the finger injury guy and he, you know, and he does this, it's easy for me to compartmentalize you. It's so much better if you keep coming to me with new information and say, hey, I think I might've been wrong about this, but now I know a better way. And that helps everybody move forward. And if, if any of us get stuck and we're we believe the same exact things 10 years from now. I think it's time for us to retire. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, well, let's get into it. And the goal is to talk about injuries and preventing injuries, managing injuries, rehabilitating injuries, and especially from, you know, kind of the coaching, training, performance perspective um, on your end. So I guess the first question, I'll kind of start broad. But training errors, are there any specific errors that you notice, you know, with climbers, with training, just in general, that may potentially like predispose them to, to getting injuries or any, you know, kind of cycles that they fall into just from kind of the years of experience that you've had working with, with climbers and, and training them? Yeah, the, the number one thing we've seen, and, and often we, we, we get a new client because they're injured or because they know they've messed up and they're like, okay, now I've got to, I've got to get this straight. But um, the number one thing we see is that a two, climbers are too quick to go to specific high intensity training means. Um, and they don't emphasize the basics of, of fundamental strength, you know, mobility um, and, and, and muscle balance uh, that, that most of us need as athletes. Um, over specialization is, is a problem in many, many realms and it's, and we're no different. You know, it's, it seems way better just to like get on the hangboard and start training those fingers, um, rather than making sure I have a stable shoulder or making sure that I, you know, have hip mobility or any of those things. And so I think that's the main problem we see is just like, you know, it's, it seems like climbing, I'm going to do more of it. And pretty soon we're, we're getting pattern fatigue and we've overloaded ourselves and, and then we're injured. And so if we can get people to address more general capacity for exercise, um, general athleticism um, and health, um, then we can start putting a ton of specific training on top of that. 
But unfortunately, most people try to shortcut that. So what's the biggest specific training error? Is it just doing too much hangboarding, you know, hanging on edges that are too small and adding too much weight? Or is it doing that too frequently? Is it climbing too frequently? Like what are the specificity errors, like kind of specifically that you notice a lot with climbers? I think the main thing is, is they try to intensify training too quickly. And, and it can be either too frequently or too much load, but there's this obsession with like pushing those training numbers up there um, without the understanding that uh, connective tissue and muscle adapt quite slowly actually, um, but they adapt well over long time periods. Like if we did, you know, low, uh, relatively low intensity strength training over the course of 18 months, um, we might see a, some real fundamental great changes in an athlete, but we, we get this idea that I'm going to go four weeks on the hangboard and I'm going to try to increase the intensity each time. And although my enthusiasm can keep up with that, my, my structure just can't do it. And so load, load tends to be the, the enemy. Um, and, and, and we do, you know, we have extremely strong fingers. Most climbers that start hangboarding are already in the 95th percentile for finger strength, you know, among humans. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the room for growth is very small and the enthusiasm is very high and, um, and we get into trouble there. So you mentioned a couple of different, instead of this kind of specialization and specificity, you know, for example, like handboarding, you mentioned a couple areas, you know, the shoulders, the hips to build this foundation for climbers. Um, what are your biases? Like what are your maybe go-to exercises for certain body regions or um, that you feel, you know, that climbers should do? Yeah, well, the, the main thing is to, to understand that we're, we're capable of, of a, tremendous amount of variability and activity. And I think it's important to, to make sure we're exploring all of that, um, exploring lateral movement um, and exploring antagonists to our prime movers. Like one of the things I've done in my past was train um, triathletes, skiers, swimmers, runners, and they all suffer from being very linear athletes. Um, and so if you have somebody that's uh, you know, a cyclist that gets out and they're, they're riding 150, 200 miles a week, and then you get them off the bike and want them to play soccer, it'll really destroy them. They're very unstable side to side. They can't accelerate backward. Um, and that makes them a very unstable athlete. They've got really strong quadriceps, um, but then pretty weak everything else. And, and so it's real important to help that athlete balance out a little bit. I think that having good shoulder and hip mobility, and then good strength through full ranges of motion in our pulling muscles, in our legs, um, goes a long way toward preventing injuries in the extremities, like in the fingers and toes, just because we, we then aren't trying to pull that hard and we're not having to just do everything with the tips of our fingers. Um, the gigantic error, and, and I've talked with, with our, our mutual friend, Jonathan Segrist about this quite a bit, is that he feels, and I, and, and I'm sure you do too, that the athletes um, that we see that are struggling the most are the ones that are maybe overqualified strength-wise for the level they climb, but they're not putting the time into increasing their, their efficiency and economy on the rock. And so good mobility and good basic general strength really helps us learn to climb well and climb efficiently. And then we can really max out our finger strength. But unless we climb well at first, it doesn't really matter how strong our fingers are. And where does, for example, power fit in? Like, for example, the ability, let's say of a climber, their max vertical jump or their ability to do a box jump. Does that matter for climbing? And does it matter maybe the height of the climber or the anthropometrics or any of that? Like how, how do you factor that into when you train climbers? Well, we, we look, we look all, all along the force velocity curve. And so, and, and your, your um, readers might not be completely familiar with that, but the force velocity curve basically encompasses all of the things we do in sport. We're at one end where it's very, very high force, but low velocity, we might have a, a single rep of a heavy weightlifting exercise, like a bench press or a deadlift. And then as the velocity increases or the, uh, the potential for velocity increases, 
Um, we get out to lighter and lighter implements that we can move more quickly, like at the very far end of it, it might be throwing a baseball, very light implement, but with high, high speed. And everywhere along that curve, if you look at an athlete, you'll see, you might see a guy that's got very, very high strength, but really no speed, no snap, no explosiveness. And we'll see that play out on the rock. If you, one of the great things now is that video is widely available of lots and lots of popular climbs. And if you shoot a video of yourself and you're, you're you know, 75% slower than almost everybody else on that, on that climb, explosiveness and power is probably a major place that you could gain some ground. Um, the other thing though, is we see people on the other end that are very explosive, very, very fast, but they can't hold those hard static positions that we might need, like specifically in hard bouldering or in trad climbing, where you have to like lock off and try to get your next finger lock in. Um, and so the, I think the really important thing with, with explosiveness, jumping, um, you know, campusing, any of that kind of training is to assess, do I need this stuff? Um, am, I, am I a slow climber? Am I, am I not depending on momentum? I think it's really critical that we see momentum as a, a friend. And if we, if we can't initiate that, it's a, it's a really good place to start by training it in the gym and then taking it on out into the rock gym and then eventually out to the boulders. And with climbers that kind of, you know, you have this whole spectrum, you mentioned kind of, you know, you can train different levels of, you know, throwing a softball would be one end of that curve and, you know, like a one RPM, right? A slow or even isometric would, would be, or one um, RM or isometric would be on the other end. Um, are there certain assessments or tests that you'll typically do for climbers to, you know, is there a battery of tests or are there certain things that you do to see if they have those capacity levels on, on each end? Yeah. And, and, you know, we, I, I, I know there's a huge amount of, of muscle fiber typing that goes into that. You know, you, you get somebody that just can't, you know, they're, they're athletic as you can, you, you can imagine, but their vertical jump is eight inches or something. You're like, okay, this may be a slow twitch athlete, but if I have an athlete that, um, you know, we, we love to see if they can, if they can do a body weight squat, if they have the mobility to squat down to a parallel position and stand up, if they can't do that, it's probably a hip mobility issue. And, and we can start with, with that just as an economy thing for climbing. Um, um, we love to see their, them be able to do pull-ups, um, be able to hold lock-off positions, um, see how strong their fingers are, not only for like um, a weighted hang, um, but for like just hanging for duration. Um, cause you'll have people that have unbelievable finger strength, but then they can't hold it for more than 10 seconds. Right. Um, you'll have other people that are way on the other end of that curve. And so you can start to see by, by putting an athlete through a battery of, um, you know, basic strength exercises, basic explosiveness exercises and basic endurance exercises. Where is this, this athlete strong or weak? I'm, I'm really, um, leery of putting them into a database of norms based on other climbers. Um, I, I think that, that that gives the wrong message to the athlete um, to say that like, oh, you're in the 10th percentile for upper body um, pressing strength uh, yeah, among climbers. Cause then the, the message is you need to develop that. When I believe the message should always be, we need to develop the skills of the sport continually always be thinking about movement, always be thinking about economy. And then when we're in the weight room, we can give a little bit more focus to specific areas. Um, but I, I always go back to the, the work that, that we see um, strength coaches and physical therapists do with professional athletes. And you say, you know, like if, if LeBron James doesn't have a really high deadlift, we don't scrap his basketball practice in order to get him picking up a barbell more. We just address that occasionally in the gym if it seems like it's a limiter for him. Um, I think that as climbers that, are, especially these, the climbers that we love that are really into training um, can, can easily go over the, over the top end on, on trying to develop specific facets of, of their finger strength or being able to do one arm pull up or something when maybe they just need better rock shoes.
Yeah, and I mean, and some climbers are more into training than they are into climbing, which is interesting. They're more psyched yeah. on their, you know, on their hangboarding routine than, you know, than on their next send. Well, isn't, and, and understandably so. I, I think the thing that's so hard about climbing is it's so un, unquantifiable. You know, you're like, you know, yeah, I, I sent this grade and I did this boulder problem, but the, the fixed nature of the gym, you know, like, you know, 200 pounds is always going to be 200 pounds. You know, uh, 18 millimeter edge is always going to be 18 millimeters. And you can look back at your training log and say, ah, yes, I did better on these things. But, you know, like, it's real hard to tell what your fitness is like. And you might only hit, a, you know, get all the pieces to come together right two or three times a year for a hard red point or a hard boulder problem. Um, and so I, I can see that the need for that feedback of, yes, training is working. I'm getting stronger. I'm getting stronger. But we've always got to take it into the performance environment and say, is my massively improved finger strength actually making me climb better? Um, because if it's not, we need to go back and say, what's really limiting us here? Yeah, so there's, there's climbing, there's this performance, there's training, and then there's injury. And with injury, all climbers at some stage have some ache, pain, tweak. I've had my own. I know, you know, anyone who's listening or watching, you know, or reading this, you know, has that has likely had their own too. And if they haven't, they probably aren't pushing themselves or, you know, or trying hard enough, you know, in the sport. Um, have you had any, you know, climbing injuries or any, you know, injuries in the process? And if so, can we chat about one of them and kind of what you did to, to manage? Yeah. So my, my most severe climbing related injury, I've had this, you know, my fair share of fingers and things like that, um, but was a uh, medial epicondylitis and um, it. So pain, it's, uh, pain on the inside of the elbow. Yeah. yeah inside the elbow um, and exacerbated by pulling um, exacerbated by, but, you know, by the time I really gave it any, um, any time at all to heal, it was, it was, it was exacerbated by everything. Um, and, you know, like picking up a glass and at the time my son was one year old and I couldn't even hold him in my left arm. Um, and so I, I went to an orthopedic surgeon and he's like, yeah, you need to take some time off. You need to see the therapist. And I was like, you know, okay, I'm, I go to the next guy, go to the next guy. And I finally got someone to do a surgery, which was a debridement of the tendon, um, mm -hmm. which is not, which isn't really in the best practices. They, you know, there's, there's not a, a lot of uh, orthopedics are going to say, that's the thing you need to do. Um, and so had that done, then took, you know, a bunch of time off in a, in a splint, then went through physical therapy, um, for a long period of time, it was like six to 12 weeks of, of therapy and then lightly coming back into climbing. Um, and just as it was getting better, my right arm, which I decided I would get really strong in my right while I was letting my left get bad. And um, my therapist was like, okay, look, you can do this surgery again, but let's do a virtual surgery. And what we're gonna do is not cut you open but we're going to do the same thing we did with your left arm, which was, he is actually like, if I it for a week afterwards, because it'll be just like surgery. Cause I, I was in a splint for maybe a week or 10 days afterwards while the, mostly while the stitches were healing. Um, but so we did that. I like splinted it for, for 10 days and then started back into the physical therapy with, with that same arm. And, and it was, um, it's so crazy because I had the exact same result. Um, and now, of course, both elbows are, are fine. I'm a little more careful about, about the telltale signs of overdoing it. Um, but what was really telling for me was that what I needed to do was change my pattern of behavior um, and understand that like, you know, whatever route, like, you know, this is 10 years ago now, 12 years ago now whatever route that was so important to me to, you know, or workout that I just had to push through another set of pull-ups doesn't matter at all, you know? And, and, you know, if you look at the big picture of your training, it's okay 
and it's very normal to have an injury. Um, the, the error is when you don't stop and address the injury when it occurs, but you just try to keep carrying on because doing more of what got you injured isn't going to get rid of that injury. Yeah, that's fascinating though, that like you like splinted the other side and almost pseudo yeah. went through that, okay, I, yeah. I had a surgery on I, this side. And, and, you know, and, and in, in learning from you and in, in learning over the years since then, I, I wouldn't do that same thing. Um, yeah. but, but I would stop my training and start doing therapy um, with the same mindset that we, we, we encourage people to take toward their training, which is give your body time to adapt, you know, do the right stuff, you know, make, make your list. I had a great, I had a great, uh, we have a wonderful orthopedic surgeon here in Lander. And um, I had a, a different injury, a finger injury that I, I was talking to him about. And he, he knows the same advice. He's like, you know, what you need to do is go easy. And for, you know, for six weeks, you're going to only climb on easy stuff. You know, you can massage it, take care of it, do, do all the things you need to do. We're going to tape it um, with the Luco tape and, uh, you know, what, whatever else we're, you know, the, the protocol was. And I was like, yeah, okay, that sounds great. And he's like, okay, so what's today's date? And I was like, ah, you know, August 15th. And he's like, okay, what is six weeks from today? And, um, and so I'm like, you know, figured it out. It's like, oh, that's September. <laughs> Do that high level math. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was really important because he said six weeks is going to turn into two and a half weeks. If, if you don't tell me that date, if you don't like mark that end date, because oh, wow. I, he's not just pulling six weeks out, you know, for fun. He's like, you know, the data suggests that it takes this long to get over an injury. And so when, when I'm told that it's going to take four weeks, I look at the calendar and I say, okay, four weeks from today is this day. That's the day that I can start thinking the therapy is not working or that I should start ramping things up or I need to change things. But until then, I need to do it for four weeks. Um, you know, you don't second guess the recipe that's written by the expert chef. You just do what he tells you to do, right? Which is hard to do because, you know, it's one, you're following someone else's guidance, you know, other, other than your own. Um, and we know better. We, we know our bodies best is at least is what we think. Yeah. Um, and the other is just when you're so psyched on something, that kind of waiting period, you almost feel like you're losing something every day. Um, like you're <laughs> losing your strength. When in the end, if you're hurt, you probably you know, you probably can't climb anyway. Um, so it's, no. it's interesting. Well, and I think that one of the things that's really challenging now is the, the gigantic amount of information that's out there. Um, and you, if you search long enough, if you do enough time on the internet, you'll eventually find someone that agrees with you. And, and then <laughs> you're going to just like you, and, and the worst is that you're going to go, and you're going to take, you know, this information from an orthopedic surgeon and this one from a, your acupuncturist and then this one from a supplement company. And, and you're going to amalgamate all of those things, even though that, you know, your orthopedic surgeon is aware of all of these therapies that are available um, and didn't prescribe those. And so I think it's really important to to uh, trust, you know, like first off. Find the, find the provider or, or the source of information you're going to trust and then trust them for, for some amount of time um, instead of going like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, do this program and this program. Um, and, uh, and, you know, like if I, if I uh, you know, if I'm getting my information from two different sources, eventually I'm going to screw things up. Um, it's like that old joke. I was on a diet, but I wasn't getting enough to eat. So now I'm on two diets. I actually haven't heard that one. I love your like jokes and yeah. analogies. Those are, you have a great one yeah. I've forgotten. You had something about a hangover of overtraining. Do you remember that one? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was like the over, like training and, and pursuing the feeling of being sore and tired. Right. And so we talk to people about, you know, the result of training should be an improvement in performance. And that should be the only marker of whether the training was, was appropriate or not. But so often we pursue feeling, you know, nauseous or sore um, or, um, you know, or throwing up. And, and what I said is like, 
you know, if you get go out and you get drunk and you crash your car, you're going to be nauseous and sore the next day, but it doesn't make a good training. Right. And that's the really fascinating thing is we pursue that, like, you know, is this working? Is this working? Is this working? And one of the things that I always thought was really fascinating is in talking through various injuries with you, um, you know, you, you encouraged me to continue to move through those range of motion. It's okay to continue to climb at, at this level or whatever. Um, and, and you said, you know, it's going to hurt, but if it doesn't hurt worse, um, it, you know, it's okay. If you, know, you have an injury and, and so often people are like, oh, I'm injured. I should feel nothing. You know, I should seek to have zero pain here. I'll put drugs in and I will cease activity. Um, but as we know, that is, you know, it's just sort of the opposite of my hangover analogy is like, that's, that's going to make it worse. <laughs> you know, if you can consistently avoid trying to make that injury get better. Yeah. It's like drinking non-alcoholic beer and trying to get drunk or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe not. I, I'm terrible with the analogy. So I, I remember I tried to quote right. you on, on the hangover one and I completely butchered it. And I was like, all right, well, at least now we have that recorded. So I can just, yeah. <laughs> just, that's right. Let me just, let me just play it. Um, all right, let's transition towards hands and fingers. So are there any warmups or any things that like you specifically do, or you recommend your, you know, your clients to do to keep them kind of warmed up before they get on the wall? Like, is there, do you just have them climb? Is there a hangboard routine? Do you use our bands? Like what, what's your advice? And then like, what do you actually do like for, for yourself to warm yeah. up your fingers? Well, so the, the really interesting thing is people are very confused about warm-up protocols. And I, and I said, okay, so the number one, um, the, 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 it's really awesome when something is descriptive of what you want to have happen. We got two things. We're going to warm and we're going to up, right? And so we're <laughs> going to start off at a low level and we're going to increase slowly the activity we're doing. So that's the up part. And then when you get to a point that you actually have a feeling of warmth, you know, we know what it feels like to have full blood flow to our hands and things like that. That's the point at which I feel we're getting a safe position to really load up the fingers. Um, there are unfortunately a lot of, um, you know, anecdotal um, things that are, uh, that are counter to that. Like, oh yeah, well, Sharma never warmed up, you know, when he was 16 or whatever. Um, it's, it's very damaging to assume that you're going to be in, in this, um, in this special realm that doesn't need to do with the stuff that everybody else needs to do. Um, and so I think taking your time and, um, going through a good solid warm up is, is just career extension a hundred percent. And so we, we usually start with general activity and, and what's fascinating is it's hard in the gym, you know, I'm going down to cinder one and I'm going to go bouldering. Well, if you and I were going to go out bouldering, you know, in Rocky Mountain National Park, we'd throw our, our packs on our back and we'd walk for 90 minutes, right? And then we'd get up there and we'd be very physically warm. And then we could just start doing some, some movement. But, you know, we go to cinder one and the approach is like 200 feet. <laughs> right? And then we're right at those boulders. I guess you could walk up the stairs or something, but, um, <laughs> but what we really want to do is make sure that we're physically ready for, for high levels of, of um, pulling. And I like to do some things that like, um, you know, get onto a big edge on the hangboard. Like once you've done a general warm up, maybe some push ups and things, maybe some easy bouldering. Um, the hangboard is a, is a great uh, place to actually get your fingers nice and warmed up. And what I'll do now, and this is a really fun one, um, and you reach up and you grab on to the board and just hang by like a big edge, like a 20 or 25 millimeter edge um, for one second, and then just drop your hands to your side and stand there for just a moment. Then go hang for two seconds, drop your hands to your side, three, four, and then work your way all the way up to 10 second hang. Um, add a big edge, no additional weight, um, but by the end of that, you've, you've hung for 55 seconds on those fingers. It'll take you a couple, three minutes to do this. But at that point, yeah, we're getting a lot of flow to those, um, you know, to the very, very tips of your fingers. Um, we're, we're getting those, you know, one of the things they've talked about, um, the porousness of tendons 
through this repeated like stretch and shorten, stretch and shorten. I don't know if it's actually doing that, but it's better than not doing it. Um, and so I think that then you can go in and gradually ramp your way up through some boulder problems and you're ready to go. And it might take you 20 minutes to get completely warmed up, but the quality of the work you can do after a warm up is always better than the quality of the work you can do if you've tried to force that warm up. We generally don't see people get long periods of, of good training in when they haven't warmed up well, and the, the risk of injury is very high. Um, and so, so we, I would say if you don't have time to train, um, just do the warm up and then come back tomorrow. Um, don't do it the other way. And for climbers, for example, so that's a really nice progressive way. That's what research supports really this progressive load. And that's really cool with the hangboard is just, you know, kind of a little bit more duration, you know, each time. Um, what about climbers? You know, I'm assuming you're climbing outdoors in cold weather, you know, out in land or you go to wild iris and your system is warm. You, you know, you warmed up your fingers, you did a nice approach, everything is good. Um, but our fingers in our hand are pretty distal or pretty far from our heart. And they're probably not as warm as our other muscles. And some people may have bad circulation. Like, uh, you know, I'll see patients and they maybe they have right node syndrome and their hands yeah. and feet are cold where another climber they're yeah. not. Is there any like outdoor weather tips or anything that you like, you know, that you do, do you put your hands in your armpits or are there any ways to kind of keep yeah. the fingers warm after you've warmed up, but it's cold? Yeah, well, you know, our circulation system is, is really a good deal. Um, and so I think even if you can get your body to a place of feeling over warm, it's, it will, it will pay, pay off at the extremities. And so one of the things that I've just really adopted in the last couple of years with this in mind is to wear, like, even if I'm feeling pretty warm, I'll keep my down jacket on um, and I'll keep like even a pair of down or, or uh, insulated pants just to keep my, my temperature as high as possible. Um, and then between, um, like, especially if it's cold out and you're trying a hard climb, this, there's, a, there's a really interesting technique that, that I've seen a couple of climbers employ, which is to, you know, you're going and you're trying your project and, um, you know, it's got little cold crimps and whatever, you come down trying to stay warm. One of the things you can do is to walk over to a nearby climb that's quite easy, like, Say your project is a 512, um, you walk over and you do a 59 in between. The 59 is not hard enough to fatigue you or to make you work very hard, but it gets the blood flowing um, into those extremities. Then you can come down and then take your rest. Um, but you just add that other, like maybe five to eight minutes of, of general easy climbing activity, keep the fingers warm. Those portable hangboards are also really nice. Um, you can take them and hang them on the branch of a tree right by the crag. Um, do, do a couple little partial pull-ups or some hangs um, just to kind of keep the, the hands warm. The other thing is, of course, to wear good, thick, warm gloves between and, and everything else. But, but yeah, just general warmth is, is the biggest thing for keeping yourself ready to act. Um, usually you can rest 30 to 45 minutes between like hard pulls on those fingers without uh, increasing your injury risk as long as you stay warm. Um, but if your core temperature drops off, you forget it. You're, you know, your fingers are going to be tired and, and, or cold. And, um, and then your chance of injury really goes up. And what about so like, I'm oh, sorry, go. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, but what about, so, like also portable, like hand warmers and things like that. Are you for those against those? Or are you like, no gloves or mitts are kind of the way to go and use your internal body temperature to, to warm up. I, I think those external things are okay, but they can trick you, right? Um, because you, you want that good warm blood flow going through your system. And so if your overall body temperature isn't warm enough, but your hands feel hot, I still think that you're at a greater injury risk. I don't, I don't have any, any data to back that up, but it's like, um, you know, some people will have those little uh, portable heaters and, you know, yeah, you're blowing warm air on your hands, but are those tendons warm? Do I actually have good blood flow to them? Um, am I vasodilated? I, I can be, you know, quite vasoconstricted and have my hands right in front of the heater. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, 
So I think that that trying to keep your body temperature up is is key, which also includes eating enough um, while you're out there. When we're out there in the cold, one of the number one things that we're fighting against is a is a lack of available calories, and so you we need to increase the number of of calories we're bringing in on on those days. Now let's transition a little bit. So you know we kind of went through talking about warmth. They're kind of keeping everything warm and warm up. Um, talked about a couple of you know your history with injuries and especially the you know the medial elbow or the, the inside of the elbow. And before that, we kind of talked about general strength training and, and ways to to assess. Are there any you know specific exercises like go to exercises that you have? for climbers, maybe let's move up the chain and talk about like the shoulder. Is there anything that, you know, that you'd recommend for climbers to, you know, stay strong to potentially prevent some type of shoulder injury? And, and if so, what does that look like when, if they were to do it? Well, our number one rule with any exercise is that it should be an exercise that you know how to do. Um, and so if I'm, if I'm looking at trying to strengthen somebody's shoulders, uh, we'll say, okay, do you, do you know the pull up? Can you, you know, most climbers know, most, most people know the basic exercises, but so we'll often start with a basic push up. You know, can you do this, this, um, you know, basic movement, you know, down to the floor, touch your chest to the floor, come back up. If they know that, then we'll say, okay, how about an overhead pressing motion? Um, you know, can you, can you press weight overhead, whether with a single arm or both arms at the same time? Um, and, and then start to look at those different, those different aspects. The dip is, is another exercise that lots of people know. It's not my favorite, but it is another pressing exercise. And so we start there. Um, but I, I'm not super obsessed with chasing numbers there. I'm more interested in making sure that I don't have a gigantic gulf between my pulling strength and my pressing strength. Um, there very often, I'll have a person that can do a single arm pull up but struggles to do it excellent push-ups, and you're like, okay, at that point, we're probably dealing with a lot of neurological inhibition. We're probably dealing with a great potential for injury um, if if an injury hasn't occurred, um, and and probably we're starting to see some of those mobility issues as you know, like a rolled forward shoulder, all all the, the sorts of things that you end up uh, seeing patients for. Um, and so I do like um, like you know, single arm exercises, whether it's pressing overhead or like a chest style press, um, the single arm stuff is, is really great for integrating your core stability. And plus when we're climbing, we very rarely will have both hands or both feet at the same level. And so I'm, I'm, I'm all about like being able to do these things individually. Um, the other thing is I like the unstable, um, like the suspension style trainers, um, because that it, again integrates a lot of core into it, and so once you can do a good push up on the floor, destabilizing it a little bit is is often you know good for the the uh, athlete's proprioception, but also it's entertaining. It's more fun than doing a push up on the floor, um, and then we can get into those more and more distal positions. And as you know, the further the hands get away from the body, the less stable the movement is and the less load we can handle. And so, you know, if, if people get really good and strong in those things like the archers and the flies become, become quite good exercises. And they're, like I said, they're fun, um, which, is, which is an important part of any supplemental training that isn't your sport. Because man, I could just have somebody bench press and deadlift for, you know, months and months and months, and they may see some benefit from that, but it's going to kill them mentally. Um, and so I want to keep making it interesting for that athlete, make it feel like that stability, we, that full body stability we try to create in climbing. Um, the other thing I love is the elastic bands and, and um, a lot of those, the uh, exercises you and I have, have um, that I've, I've been really happy to participate in um, when we've taught together um, just fabulous ways of getting strong way out here at, at the extremities and having some stability in there between your scapulas. Yeah. Is there any kind of final advice or any kind of last words that you have for climbers that almost in a, from your wisdom from yourself climbing and from training other you know, climbers that you've seen have gotten hurt and injured. Is there any last words you have for like injury prevention advice? Kind of yeah. a, you know. 
Well, I'll tell you, this is our, this is our number one rule for the climb strong coaching team. Number one goal is to prevent injury. And second goal is to improve performance. Um, and I think that that's, that's really important that athletes keep that in mind that when I go out to the gym or I go on, get on my hangboard, the number one thing I'm trying to do is to keep myself from getting hurt by performing on the rock. Um, beyond that, then I can try to get stronger, you know, you know, whatever I want to do, get more explosive, lose weight, any of those things. But if we, if we injure ourselves, we've, we've left the path. And so it's all about like, is, is this helping me or, or driving me, you know, closer to injury. And so we've got to keep making that assessment. So number one rule, reduce injury. Number two, improve performance. Well, thank you, Steve, for you know going through all this information. And where can people find you again, where they can find your resources, your books, your content? Yeah, you can find me at climbstrong.com. And we also have a presence on Facebook and Instagram and, and those things. But, but the easiest place to find the great information is at our website. Awesome. Well, thanks, Steve. All right.